to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor and the broken heart and new life. And for those who mourn, heaven's child is born. This is the gospel of Christ. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Welcome to our study of Jesus, the author of eternal salvation. You know, as we think about the idea of Jesus being the author of eternal salvation, this word for author is a very unique word. In fact, it's only used one time in the New Testament. That makes it unique, makes it special. When God inspired the New Testament, He wrote it in the common language. And thus, to find a special or unique word like this, there is an idea that God is trying to get across. The word literally means that which causes or is the source of anything that resides. It's the idea of being the reason or force for an action. You know, the idea of author carries with it someone who maybe writes a book, someone who invents a storyline, and, and there are some similarities there, but maybe even a better word would be the inventor. Jesus is the inventor of eternal salvation. He brought it to fruition. The idea was His. The idea was in the mind of God. And Jesus put it into action by His perfect life, by His perfect lifestyle in every way. You know, when you think about famous inventors and inventions and the effect that they've had on life and humanity, where would we be? without certain inventions that have made life so much more productive. For example, in the year 1903, the Wright brothers invented the airplane. And look at what a difference that has made in our ability to go to other countries, even in the ability to spread the gospel to places may not have reached before. But before the airplane, a man by the name of Gottlob Daimler created the automobile in the year 1889. And look at the way travel has taken off with the automobile, with roads, with engines, and all that goes along with that. You think of other inventions like, for example, the steel plow. John Deere made the steel plow in 1836. And look at the way agriculture has changed for good because of that. Thomas Edison created the light bulb, invented it in the year 1879. And the lighting of things today, the, the, the absence of dark, the way lights work, how efficient and effective they are, think about how much that invention has changed the world. And then think about the greatest invention of all time. Jesus Christ is the greatest inventor and the greatest invention ever is salvation, bringing that to fruition. That's what God did. That's what God made possible through His Son, Jesus Christ. And so today we want to ask several questions as it relates to Jesus, the author or inventor of salvation. First of all, what makes it possible for Jesus to be the cause, the author, the inventor of salvation. And friend, as you think about the salvation we have, this is only possible because of the perfect life that Jesus lived. Jesus makes salvation possible because He lived a perfect life of obedience to God. Were it not for Jesus' life and His perfection, salvation wouldn't be possible. Having been perfected, the Hebrew writer says he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. But what does it mean that Jesus became perfected? Friends, just like me and just like you, Jesus faced challenges, he faced difficulties, he was tempted, and yet through all that, he lived a pure and perfect life. Notice what the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 4 and verse 15. The Bible says, For we do not have 
a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, notice, yet without sin. It's not though we can't sympathize with Jesus. Jesus can't sympathize with us. He knows what I'm going through. He knows what you're going through because he's been there, and yet Jesus did it without sin. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 22, he committed no sin, nor was guile or deceit found in his mouth. And for that reason, the Bible says, God made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin, to be the sin offering on our behalf that we might be the righteousness of God in him. When we think about Jesus, the Son of God, we must realize he is that perfect example of a life lived correctly. You know, and John said in John 1 verse 29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I believe Mark summed it up in Mark 7 37 when he said this, And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. What a great commentary on the perfect life of Jesus. He did everything well. That summarizes Jesus, the inventor of salvation, by his perfect life. But what else did Jesus do that makes this salvation possible? Jesus makes this salvation possible by his suffering that he gave on Calvary. I want you to think about Hebrews 5, verses 7 through 8. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things he suffered. Jesus had to suffer to make salvation a reality, to bring it to fruition. He had to go through horrible, horrible suffering. Think about the words of 1 John chapter 2. And I want you to notice what the Bible says in verses 1 and 2. The scripture says... John says, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours alone, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus suffered for all mankind. He gave up his life. Hebrews 2 verse 9, He tasted death for every man. He was offered outside the camp. Hebrews 13, verse 12. He suffered greatly so that I could have the hope of eternal life and so that you could as well. You know, Peter thought about this suffering and Peter saw the suffering Jesus went through in many ways firsthand. And when he thought about this suffering, here's what he said in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 1. Peter said... Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Peter identifies that this suffering was in the flesh, meaning that it did hurt. When Jesus suffered, it was painful. The things he went through were agonizing. And Jesus did all of that so that we could have the hope of eternal life through him. Now I want you to think about for just a moment some of the passages that teach us about the suffering of our Lord Jesus Christ. For example, take your mind back to the events surrounding the cross, the events surrounding the trial and crucifixion of Jesus. Think about this. Jesus suffered horribly at the hands of ungodly men. In Matthew 26 and verse 67, the Bible says this, Then... They spat in his face and beat him, and others struck him with the palm of their hands. Before that Roman government, before the Jews and, and all the evil people of that day, what did they do to Jesus? Can you imagine? They spit in the face of the Lord. They beat him. They strike him with the palm of their hand. And I don't think it's a, a slap. I think it's more with the palm, with the, this part of the hand, more like a martial arts hit. They did that to Jesus as part of his suffering. But then think about this also. In Matthew 27, verse 26, we're told, Then he, Pilate, released Barabbas to them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. What else did Jesus go through? Jesus was scourged. Friend, when you think about the scourging of Christ, we're talking about something like a whip with metal 
or bone or pieces of glass embedded in the end of it. They would stretch Jesus back tightly across a, a post or something like that. And then over and over again, they brought that whip down on the back of Jesus. Why? Why did they do that? He hasn't done anything wrong. They did that so that Jesus would suffer the penalty of my sin and for yours. They may not even have known that, but in God's mind, that suffering Jesus went through was the suffering that each of us deserved to receive. And yet Jesus took our place. We learn in Matthew 27, verses 28 and 29, not only did they scourge Jesus, the Bible says this, and they stripped Him and put a scarlet robe on Him, and when they twist in a crown of thorns, they put it on his head. They take Jesus and after they've beaten him, they place that robe on his back and then that, that robe adheres to the sores and the wounds. They take a crown of thorns, long thorns, and they put it in the, on Jesus' head and they press it into his brow. Can you imagine the suffering Jesus had to endure? Making him out to be a king, mocking Jesus, and then listen to these words. Then they spat on him, took the reed, struck him on the head, and when they mocked him, they took the robe off. That, that crown of thorns that's in the brow of Jesus, they then hit him on the head with something like a stick and pressed those thorns into his brow. And then that robe, which had adhered to his bloody back, they tore off and the pain started all over again. And then we learn in Matthew 27, verse 35, then they crucified him and divided his garments casting lots. They took the Lord and Savior, the great inventor of salvation, and they nailed Him to a cross. And for every breath, Jesus had to put pressure on His ankles and to exhale, He had to let it out on His arms. And Jesus suffered in agony until He died on that cruel cross for me and for you. Jesus has the right to be the inventor of salvation because of what he suffered in this life and what he gave up. But let's think about this then. What is it that makes this salvation that, that Jesus brought to life so great? What is it about salvation that makes a person want to take part in that? Friend, this salvation is great because it's eternal in nature. We're not being, talking about being saved temporarily, momentarily. We're talking about being saved from sin forever if one obeys the gospel. Matthew 25, verse 46, Jesus said, The righteous will go away into eternal life, never ever having to worry about sin and death and all the things that go along with that. When I get to heaven, it will be eternal in nature. But you know, sometimes when we think about eternal life, we only think in terms of time. But when God defined eternal life, God didn't define it based on time. Here's God's view of eternal life. John 17, 3, notice what the Scripture says. The Bible says, in John chapter 17 and verse 3, and this is, Jesus speaking, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. What's eternal life all about? Living forever, not in the real sense. That's included in it. But Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they may know you. Eternal life is being in a close relationship with God, having that closeness, that oneness. That's the real essence of eternal life. What else makes this salvation great? This salvation is great because it is salvation from sin and from Satan. What is it in this life that hurts man? It's sin and the work of Satan. Sin causes death. And friend, it's something we all have to deal with. Romans 3 verse 10 says, There is none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3 verse 23. And as a result of the fact that all have sinned, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Not dying physically necessarily, but spiritual death. The soul who sins shall surely die. It's the death, the eternal destruction of the soul in hell. Think about it in these terms. In Isaiah chapter 59 verses 1 and 2, the Bible says the Lord's ear is not heavy that he cannot save, nor his arms shorten 
that he cannot save, nor is ear heavy that he cannot hear, but your sins and your iniquities have separated you from your God. Sin is a separation. If eternal life is being in the closeness of God, then the opposite of that is sin is a separation from God and from his presence. But the good news is Jesus and the salvation he brought to life gives us hope from sin. Remember Romans 6, 23? The wages of sin is death. But aren't you thankful for the last part of that verse? But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. But not only am I saved from sin, I also can be saved from Satan and all his devices. The Bible says that Satan is like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's actively trying to cause men and women to be lost. But here's the good news about Jesus' salvation. He, Jesus, through death, overcame him in the power of death and has released those who all their lifetime were subject to bondage. Jesus defeated death and he has defeated Satan. And thus, we think about the words of Romans chapter 6, verse 17. Notice this beautiful statement that Paul makes. The Bible says, God be thanked that though you were the slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine which you were delivered. We have the hope that as we have obeyed the gospel, we can know we've been delivered from sin and Satan. But then there's a third thing that makes this salvation so great, and it's this. This salvation is ultimately in that beautiful place we know as heaven or paradise. Remember what Jesus told his disciples in John 14? His disciples had been hearing that Jesus was about to have to leave them. He was going to go back to the Father. And knowing that they would get discouraged, Jesus said this, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. Were it not so, I would have told you. And then he said this, I go to prepare a place for you and... If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive it to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus has gone to prepare that heavenly place, that place where there be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more death. All the former things have passed away. Revelation 21 and verse 4. That place the Bible describes as paradise. Jesus said to the thief in Luke 23 verse 43, this day, you shall be with me in paradise. Don't you long to go to a place like that? I think of the words of Romans 8, 18. Paul said, we consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And so when we think about heaven, that wonderful eternal home of all the saved, friend, that's one of the things that makes salvation so great. But then let's ask another important question about this salvation that Jesus has invented or brought to life. Who can receive this salvation? Who's it for? Is it for just a few? Is it just for the elite? Is it just for one group or another? The good news is all who are willing to obey Jesus can access this salvation. Remember again Hebrews 5 verses 8 and 9. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things he has suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation. Listen, to all who obey him. This salvation is not prejudiced. It's not biased. It's not just for one group. Any person who's willing to obey God and submit to him can and will be saved. I love the words of Peter in Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35. Notice how God does win all to be saved. The Bible says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but notice, every nation who fears Him and works righteousness is accepted by Him. God's not prejudiced or God's not partial. The Bible says every nation, every nation who does what? Fears Him and works righteousness can be accepted. Friend, the good news is this salvation is available to the whole world. Here's the nature of God. God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4. How bad does God want that? God wanted it so bad 
his son, his only unique son, tasted death for every man. He is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours alone, for the sins of the whole world. When God makes his invitation, he's clear. He says, come to me all. You who labor and are heavy laden, Matthew 11, verse 28, let whosoever will come. God says in Revelation 22, verse 17, and friend, anyone who is willing to change their life and submit to the will of God can be saved. Notice what Paul said to a, a group of idolatrous people in Acts 17, verse 30 and 31. The scripture says, truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Why? Because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained, and he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. I know God is willing and able to save all who will repent. All men everywhere from every nation who are willing to obey God's will can partake of this salvation. But then there's one final question that we need to ask. How does a person obey Jesus, the inventor or author of salvation? Friend, if Jesus is the author and if he's the inventor, he owns the patent. He holds the right and he gets to set the guidelines for what a person must do to be saved. It doesn't matter what I think. And it does, in all honesty, matter what you think or some religious leader somewhere thinks. Here's what matters. What does the Scripture say? Romans 4, verse 3, Jeremiah 37, and verse 17. What has God said one must do to become a Christian? And friend, it's this simple. If you will do what God says in the Bible, you can partake of this salvation. I love the words of Mary at the wedding in Cana in John chapter 2. Somehow Mary has sensed that Jesus is going to perform his first miracle, turning the water into grape juice, turning the water into wine. And in John chapter 2, when she realizes Jesus is going to do this, she turns to the servants and says, Whatever he, Jesus says to you, do it. Friend, any person who will have that mindset, whatever God says to me in the Bible, I'm going to do it. That person can be saved. In fact, look at what Jesus said. Jesus realized it wasn't enough just to verbalize his name, but you had to do what he said. Notice Matthew chapter 7, verses 21. The Bible says, Jesus speaking, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. It isn't enough just to look up and say, Lord, Lord, you've got to be willing to do what God says. Jesus asked this haunting question to the religious elite, to the Pharisees in Luke 6, 46. Jesus said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Friend, it is true that if I'm going to be saved, I've got to obey Jesus. Obedience is essential to salvation. In fact, you can't say you love God if you're not willing to obey Him. Did you know that's what Jesus said? Jesus simply said, If you love me, keep my commandments. Well, let's ask, what, what must a person do then to be saved? What does Jesus say I've got to do to be saved? The Scriptures clearly teach that a person must first hear the Word of God. The Bible says in Hebrews 11 verse 6, Without faith, it's impossible to please God. If I have to have faith to please God, then whatever way I get faith is essential. How do you get faith in God? Romans 10, 17 tells us, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. To be saved, I first must hear the Word of God, which creates faith in the individual. You remember what Jesus said to every one of the seven congregations in Revelation? In every one of those letters, Jesus said, To him that has ears, let him hear. I must listen carefully to what God says and only accept his word as the final truth. Secondly then, I must believe in Jesus. Here's what Jesus said. Jesus said, Unless you believe that I am he, you'll surely die in your sins. John chapter 8, verse 24. But it can't stop at the point of belief only. 
There's more to being saved than just believing in Jesus. A person also has to repent. The Bible says, Jesus speaking in Luke chapter 13, verse 3 and verse 5, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Repentance is a turn. Acts 3 verse 19, Peter preached, Repent and turn again that your sins may be blotted out. Are you willing today not only to believe in Jesus, not only to accept His Word as the final guide, but to turn from a life of sin to a life of serving God? If so, would you make that great confession? Jesus taught us it was essential to confess Him before men. Jesus said, if you won't confess Me before men, neither will I confess you before the Father who is in heaven. Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33. Having made that great confession... Would you be immersed in water to obey Jesus? Here's how plain and how simple Jesus made it. In Mark 16, 16, Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. If you've got the mindset, whatever Jesus says, I'm going to do it, then friend, you've got to realize, Jesus said you must believe and be baptized. For what reason? To be saved. That's in accord with the first gospel sermon. In Acts chapter 2, when they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? The answer was, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Baptism's not something you do two weeks after you're saved. It's not something that is just something good to do, but not necessary. The Bible says one must be born of water and spirit to get into the kingdom of God. John chapter 3 and verse 5. And so we ask you today, are you sure you've accessed this great salvation? He is. Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. Ask yourself, have I really obeyed the Word of God? Are you sure today? Friend, don't, don't wonder. Don't guess. Are you sure based on the knowledge of God's Word that you're saved? If not, we encourage you today, get your life right. Make sure you have access to this great salvation before it's everlastingly too late. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.